You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome to Proof Text and Glossa House TV. I'm Dr. Michael Halcom, and today I have the great privilege of having Dr. Jesse Schumann back on the show. Um, Jesse, it's good to see you, man. You look good. Uh, how are you doing? Doing well, Michael. It's good to be back. Yeah, what we're in mid-June and loving weather in Boston, loving summer. Life is yeah. good. Excellent. So do you have a, a re- reflecting on sort of your last uh, school year, how were things, how'd things go? Yeah, it went well here at Sattler College. I, um, you know, the longer you are somewhere, what you uh, you can call it um, uh, a competency creep or something like that, where uh, you just keep picking up responsibilities and stuff. And <laughs> so it was it was definitely the busiest year, busiest semester yet. And uh, yeah, so this break is a little bit just like what can i say yes to and what do i need to cut back on um but as far as i mean what i was doing all all good things so it's been good, good. i saw that uh sattler just got uh jose diaz he's coming to do greek with you guys uh, yeah you know, flips between jose and joe i don't know depending on who he's talking to i guess but um yeah i saw him posting about that so good for you guys yeah, that's it's exciting. It's exciting. He is um he's been doing a lot with Greek and he certainly he has a really high ceiling. Um and so not not too many people who are equipped to be able to do communicative biblical Greek uh who also are at a life stage to be able to pick up and come to Boston. Um and but but for the right person i think it's going to be the right job and i think we got the right person with with jose and to be able to to drive the program forward because one of the unique things with sattler college is five different majors but every student takes a year uh, a year of greek and a year of hebrew and so i handle the hebrew side of things and then jose will come in and handle the greek side of things great great um so let's talk a little bit i mean we've, we've talked in the past about you know, Hebrew and whatnot. Um, You've been at it a while now, man. Um, How long have you been at Sattler, by the way? I just finished my sixth year. Six years. So you've been, you've been doing the communicative thing for a while and six years at Sattler. Um, I'm wondering as you went into year six and completed year six, what were some of the things that maybe you changed or, you know, new things you tried um, is that's the first question. And the second part of that is, was there anything you learned this year? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If I could uh, riff off a version of your first question yeah. and just set up a little bit about how like kind of big picture or what I seek to do with, with my curriculum and the approach doing. So for, for Hebrew, I would say it's a communicative approach to Hebrew. We rely heavily on TPR or total physical response where I say something and then you do it. I say kum and you get up, I say shev and you sit down. And so, so that's first day is stand up, sit down, I think I keep first day. I used to do a lot. I used to do something like 25 words or whatever. Um, and I've, I've scaled it back um, mm. to, I think first day I only do about 10 words, 10 unique lexical items and focusing mainly on, I think three vocab words that I want okay. students to be able to memorize. Um, basically. So that's a little bit about very, very beginning, but then I would say I've got three stages of the curriculum. So the first stage is really just kind of a vocabulary builder and beginning uh, grammar building blocks. And so I really don't have students read much except for just example sentences, writing, 
sentences, but it, n there's no narrative that I have students read for the first six weeks. The, mm -hmm. the reading portion of the course begins in week seven, and then we enter the storytelling portion where we're still doing a lot of total physical response. We're still doing a lot of drills and games and stuff in class, but then it enters a reading portion where I've written these 16 graded Hebrew reader stories right. where it starts really short and simple. And then every story grows just a little bit. It grows a little bit in length, grows a little bit in terms of new vocabulary and grows a little bit in terms of complexity. And there's 16 stories there. And so that gets us through midway through second semesters, just going through these stories. And then the last six weeks is through Jonah, um, going through the entire Jonah text. And so that's kind of big picture with the curriculum. As far as what I'm looking to do differently, I would say, um, at least a couple things. So one is, and this kind of intersects with uh, Glossa House and publishing and such, um, those 16 graded Hebrew stories I've been doing for, for many years, tweaking a couple years, I gathered a team of other scholars to double check my work um, and put it in its final form produce some videos, some audio with it. The last thing that I'm doing with my wife, Marissa, is we are illustrating the stories. And right. so the plan is to have two volumes of an illustrated reader to do the 16 stories. It'll be something like uh, 300 total pages. So as far as um, picture to text, that's kind of one of the more exciting things about it is that there's a very high picture to text ratio. Um, so each page with a picture doesn't have that much text. And so I think by and large, um, we're, we're illustrating what's being uh, spoken about. I really love the illustration style. It's the first time that Marissa's ever done full color. She's always no. done just black and white before. Um, and she's uh, figured out how to do full color on the iPad. Um, okay. And actually with that, I'll just pause. And uh, it's been a fun project. Um, we, we began work on this um, uh, almost, uh, let's see, I think it was a year and a half ago we began work on it. And we really partnered with the students at Sattler College in a fun way. Um, we always have about three to four students over for a brunch on Saturday during the semester, oh, something cool. like 12 to 14 Saturdays a semester. We, I just have a sign up sheet and students sign up. We live pretty close to the dorms. I pick them up, drop them off, a couple hours at our place. Marissa makes an amazing meal. It's a good time. And so that's kind of, we've always had that going on. And so um, with this project and students, they've been acting out the stories and um, in, in the class before. And so what we would do is uh, we would say, hey, for this Saturday, we're going to take pictures for the David and Goliath story or the David and Abigail story or the Ark and the Philistine story. And, uh, and students would, would act it oh, out. Nice. And that was really helpful in, in a lot of ways. Uh, one is Marissa was able, so uh, she'd just take pictures with the iPad or to get action shots, she would do a slow mo movie um, to do anything like walking or getting up or fighting or whatever. Um, and then so a, a slow motion video and then play the video and then wherever she liked the action, then just do just press pause and then do a screenshot. And then you've got a picture. Well, that's super helpful because then she can import that picture into the drawing app, set it as a backdrop to the um, wow. says the backdrop, increase the transparency, and then just trace. Nice. Uh, so the, the first step, which is just doing the line drawing, um, 
with the flashcards and everything else that she's done in the past, that would just take for ever yes, um, sure. and she would first do pencil um you can erase and uh, but certain things especially with like foregrounding or whatever like yeah. the um, the proportions many times sometimes wouldn't seem right right and she would be doing different like measurements with a ruler and she knew different like rules of thumb with you know if you're this is this big then your whatever should be that big um and uh anyway so this just like speeds it up tremendously yeah, yeah. um and then also allows us to be able to have uh consistent characters um so then the the moses character always looks a certain way um awesome. and um so and so that was really helpful a lot of uh for a lot of things with the uh, with getting the pictures to turn out really good and, and, and just have a lot of uh, variation, but then also life to it. Um, but it's also just been a tremendously fun project to be able to work on with others. Right. Um, collaboration. Right? I mean, collaboration is, uh, it just makes every, yeah. it, everything richer. Uh, sometimes it's, many times it's hard to pull off, but yeah. if you can, working with others i mean and so we've just been able to share in this with with dozens of awesome. the students that's great did, did you guys consider um saving the the little video clips and maybe putting like hebrew voiceover over them or like actually using them pedagogically mm, yeah uh, Potentially. Um, now for that, for in my in my Hebrew class, we always when students. So we take a week to learn the story and I do something called embedded reading where I have the, the yeah. full version of the story that students act out on Friday and I take a video. So I, I take a video of that with my GoPro and I put it up on YouTube, but I just have it unlisted so no one can find it, but it's for the students um, right. to be able to just go back and watch maybe a couple times or whatever over the weekend before quiz on Monday. Um, oh, right. But the embedded version, it, the embedded readings is that there's three versions of the story that fit together like Russian nesting dolls. Yeah. Um, and so they learn a first version and this is all just kind of outside of class with videos and whatever. Uh, um, the first version is one third the length of the full. Um, and so it has a lot of the, the details, whatever. Um, and it, you know, makes enough sense in and of itself. Um, but then the second version, it adds new lines, but then it adds extra descriptive details. And then the third version puts everything together. What's nice there is that it makes it a more stepped approach. Um, and then also gives built in uh, repetition and, and then helps to produce fluency. So right. the, the repeated times of seeing something and reading something, etc. cetera. So, um, so what happens? Um, so let's, let's say you have like these students who go through a year of Hebrew, for example, and uh, they take your classes and they just love it. Right. Or they're like incredible at it. What happens for them after year one? Are there other opportunities to, to do Hebrew stuff? What does that look like? There are other opportunities. Yeah. So, uh, freshmen take Greek, sophomores take Hebrew, every sophomore takes Hebrew. And then so junior year, senior year, you can take more. Um, and so I have a full second year, so nice. an intermediate Hebrew course and then a Hebrew exegesis course that we do at Sattler. Um, and I've been offering that pretty much every year. And so that's that's an option for students to be able to do. Are you finding, um, I mean, you're six years into this, uh, are you finding that your students have a, a love for Hebrew at the end of it all that, one, they didn't have coming in, but I'm also interested, do they, do they have a love for the language that, so yesterday uh, I went to this event and I met a former undergrad student of mine. I didn't know he was going to be there, but we were talking. And this, this student said he had, after he finished his bachelor's, had enrolled in Liberty Online. 
Liberty hmm. University online. I mean, you think you have connections with Liberty, right? Uh, not formally. No. Okay. Um. Oh, wasn't for you. Liberty was uh, was it Bethlehem or? Yeah, I mean, Bethlehem College and Seminary is where I did a lot of my education before. Yes, right. Sorry. Um, I didn't mean to confuse those as though they were the same. But anyways, he um, he mentioned to me that he enrolled in an online Hebrew course. And this was his first semester of the master's degree program. And he was, he's like, I was texting people today, just telling them to pray, for, asking them to pray for me. I'm just, I want to quit. He's like, I, I don't like Hebrew. I just don't yeah. know that I want to do this program anymore. I'm just ready to quit. And I was like, man, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, I was trying to explain to him. It's, it's The problem isn't Hebrew, right? The the problem is, the problem is typically the, the pedagogy, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. So I'm just curious. Are you finding that students have a, a, a love and appreciation for Hebrew coming out of your first year or the, their year with you that maybe they don't in the standard mm-hmm. Hebrew program or even, you know, a one semester Hebrew. Program. Yeah. 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 I, I do. And so I'm, I'm at a very unique place where Hebrew is a required course for all students here at Sattler College. So it's compulsory education. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the only under a uh, liberal arts undergraduate school in North America that requires a year of Greek, a year of Hebrew. Uh, someone can fact check that. I think that's true. Um, and so I've got a couple challenges. One is to not have students like despise me, um, <laughs> right? Because especially, I mean, we've got Bible, business, history, computer science, and biology. So, uh, I mean, even Bible students, there's a, a number of Bible students who would rather not take Hebrew or Greek. Um, and and then all the other majors too, and probably especially there, the biology majors. The biology majors, uh, it's, it's a very tough program. They've got a lot of things that they need to be able to do to be able to take the MCAT and get into med school. And so, so Hebrew is just, you know, keeping them or, you know, it could be viewed as just keeping them from focusing on what they, they want to do. So I certainly have a very tough task here at Sattler. Um, but I've been able to craft it and execute it in such a way where for a lot of students, I I would say probably to a person, everybody finds Hebrew enjoyable, um, which is remarkable. Um, And and then I think, and most people uh, find it also worthwhile. So enjoyable, also worthwhile. with our low enrollment numbers, and then also just students who are in those other majors that don't have a lot of wiggle room. I haven't had that many students in like the higher level Hebrew courses, but those who have finished two years, I I should go back and I should actually do a questionnaire of all the students who have uh, done two full years with me about um, how many of them are reading their Hebrew Bibles regularly, mm. um, multiple times a week, just to read, not for right. any kind of uh, study for a sermon or teaching or anything like that, but just um, I'm, optimally, what I would like is, hey, that's why I do my devotional reading. And I think my success rate, if I were to guess, um, those who have taken two full years who are regularly in their Hebrew Bibles, I would say it's above 50%. Wow. Um, which. Um, That's remarkable. For, for your typical like grammar translation seminary, I think if they were to. Um, if they were to do like an exit exam, um, they would find far fewer than 10% are 
regularly reading their Hebrew. I would say one um, percent, maybe zero. It, it it may be, it may be. I, I th- there are some odd ducks, um, but yeah, I, I think it is. It's uh, dishearteningly low, dishearteningly low. And so, how can we make it higher? I think you're right that um, the approach matters a lot, and so a natural language approach um, if if you make it fun. And then, I mean, basically my thought about, uh, I mean, just human uh, willpower and motivation is basically you only keep doing something that uh, you enjoy and you're good at. Um, if you enjoy it and you're good at it. And honestly, a lot of the enjoyment comes from getting good at it. Um, so we need to be able to teach Greek and Hebrew in such a way that we can actually get students good at reading. Yeah. And so to increase reading fluency, um, and there, you know, um, our, our fledgling communicative approach to Hebrew, there's, um, I would say by and large, we've been successful. Um, And there's an interesting question about um, like, do, do you push to have students read biblical texts? And if so, how early, when? Right. Um, And so I, I was trained at a, a place for communicative Hebrew um, that intentionally put off reading biblical texts. Um, the fear was that if students are reading a, a, a familiar text, they're really not reading, but they're just doing a kind of decoding. Right. Um, and so it, it's just, you know, well, a few lines or whatever to get their bearings right. And then they, once they know where it's from, then they can start playing a matching game. Like, right. oh, okay, okay. So what, what, this is Samson, um, and Delilah or whatever. And so, okay, okay. Now you can start going, this is that, this is that, that is that. And so you're not really reading, but you're doing a right. kind of version of decoding. Um, and and some people and well so i i recognize that as a danger um but then the question is as well of well what's the goal what's what level of fluency yeah. or what what's the goal what's the end goal with teaching greek or hebrew students who go through your program what do you want them to do um and so um uh, some people um and institutions in in israel have the luxury of being able to build out like a full two-year program where something like fluency speaking fluency uh con uh conversational about daily life um, is is kind of the goal. And if so, then it makes sense to to buy step um, biblical stories and whatever. Um, because you've got a much higher goal and that's where you're going and that's why students are going, so that's totally fine. Um, but how do we expect colleges and seminaries across the world who are training, let's just say seminaries, training pastors to know Greek and Hebrew and use Greek and Hebrew on a regular basis? Um, how do we expect them to adopt a communicative approach? Mm. Um, and there, I don't think we can avoid biblical texts um, because the Bible, like that is the carrot. 
That's the right. carrot. That's the only right. reason why we're offering Greek and Hebrew in seminaries. Right. And that's the only reason why students, um, you know, could bear to go through these classes um, is because we say, and rightly so, that it'll help them better understand and uh, be interpreters of the Bible. Um, and if you're leading someone with the carrot, uh, you can only hold it in front of them for too long before you let them to start eat, let them start eating the carrot. Um, mm. And and so so I do maybe a bit more than some with a communicative approach of of getting into the bible so first six weeks again we're not reading the first two stories are non-biblical i just kind of made them up and then uh, after that the next 14 stories are condensed slightly edited simplified biblical hebrew stories um, in a sense, it's kind of like going through a, a children's uh, storybook Bible, um, but in Hebrew. Um, right. But it's still at a level, I tell students, it's still at a level that I think I can show you something in these stories that you haven't seen before, you haven't noticed right. before, you'll get an insight. Um, and that's kind of letting them eat from the carrot, maybe just eat the carrot, and then I'll put a new carrot out um, for the for the next week. And then that we can also go through the entire book of Jonah. And on the last day, I have, a, it's a 50 minute lecture in Hebrew about the structure and message of Jonah. And right. it's all in Hebrew. So like, we are doing the kinds of things that your seminaries um, want their students to be able to do, uh, to engage the Hebrew text, become better interpreters right. of the Hebrew text. Um, and um, But we're doing it in a way that uh, students enjoy throughout um, and is making them better readers in terms of like they can pick up their Hebrew Bible and read right. through a paragraph or a chapter or whatever, and it doesn't take laboriously long. Yeah, I would um, say like 99% of the people I went through seminary with, like the MDiv, for example, would not be able to pick up their Hebrew Bible and just read read it and understand it. Yeah, yeah you do have that one you know, group that's an outlier. They usually go on to get a PhD or something like that. Um, I think, I think as a as someone who teaches Greek communicatively and I've taught Latin communicatively as well, mm -hmm. I've tried a little bit of the Hebrew communicative in my Hebrew classes. Um, but I think as someone who who teaches the languages in this fashion, I, here's what I think we've missed. Or mm. what, what Bible colleges and seminaries have missed. And my, this is my goal as a language teacher. Um, and I, I love the idea of like getting them into the Bible. Like I think that is noteworthy. I love the idea of getting them to speak. But like my bottom line mm. is I just want them to love the language. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel like that's been overlooked. Like Bible colleges, especially seminaries, they don't care if students come out loving the languages. Yeah. Like they want them to know grammar rules, right? So yeah. like I want my students to and you talk about them enjoying the class, right? But yeah. like, I want them to enjoy it to the end that they love the language because if they love they love the language or learn to love the language in that class, chances are they're gonna keep returning to it later yeah. in life. Yeah. I think that's right. That's totally that's totally right. Um and that also kind of gets at um well how much how much do you give students in the first year and um i think there can be a, a temptation to give too much uh you kind of have this well i'm only guaranteed one year and right. so and you feel this kind of pressure to get through a certain amount you know because yeah. i'm only guaranteed one year um but if in doing so you just overwhelmed them right. then you've zapped them of any yeah. desire to keep going back to it 
Um, and so far better to give less, but give them, instill in them, as you said, the love for it, because then they'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, the student that I ran into yesterday, and he's ready to throw in a towel, right? Like, uh, yeah. I is my first semester or first year of seminary and I I'm in Hebrew now and I hate it. And it's made mm. me want to quit seminary. I mm -hmm. don't know that I want to do this anymore because of Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, man, it's like devastating to hear that. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, that, that's, that's my own philosophy, man. Like, let's just, let's make the students love the language because if they love it, they're going to keep returning to it. Yeah. Like, um, How do you go about making, uh, making, helping uh, students fall in love with the language? Yeah, I think, I think um, in the classroom, I, I tend to be very sort of charismatic, like uh, I have so much fun with the language. And I think that that joy of just like speaking Greek, or like, speak, you yeah. know, like working with the language just oozes out like it's a yeah. lot of humor i use a lot of humor um uh, and so i mean that starts you know pretty much on day one so a lot <laughs> of humor a lot of fun um and here's something i think is very very important um that that's also overlooked is that i you know i've been i'm a native english speaker you know i'm 40 43 years old going on 44 right and i still mess up every day in English, mm -hmm. every day I trip over my words. Mm -hmm. And um, there has been this kind of, this kind of like attitude in the communicative community or at least pockets of it, of like a sort of purity or a, a, a perfection almost. And that, mm -hmm. and I'm like, heck with that. Like yeah. no, no ancient Greek was, talking perfectly every day they messed up just like i do yeah. so in the classroom i think it's really healthy when students hear me mess up and see me mess up and sometimes there'll be self-correction sometimes there won't yeah. um but i think i think that too because what that does dude is it it, it it's like um it, it's like opening the pressure release valve yeah on the classroom, right? Yeah. Because you go into a regular Bible college or seminary classroom and um, students are quizzed and there's like all this pressure surrounding quizzes, right? Yeah. And then there's yeah. tests, exams. So there's all this pressure surrounding that. Um, you know, there, there's other things that happen inside the classroom and it's just pressure, 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 pressure. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, come in and your job is to mess up. Yeah. As long yeah. as I see that you're going for it, mess up by all means mess up and like watch yeah. me mess up yeah yeah all the pressure yeah. is let yeah. out and now students can just relax and go for it um yeah you know so you know i i do other things these i used to use a lot of puppets um these days i do a lot more drawing um mm. and I'm a terrible artist. And so, um, <laughs> oh, man. You know, yeah, even yeah. that is, even that is funny to students, right? Like I'll try to do these drawings and, um, you know, uh, yeah, but I, I, I do have like a carrot kind of thing as you were talking about. Um, you know, I just finished teaching a 10 week online Greek course, um, through uh Glossa house. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I'd done it through Glossa house. And, um, just the comments I kept hearing along the way, you know, things like, you know, that was a game changer for me, or I had mm -hmm. never realized this about mm -hmm. grief or, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I, I think all of that, like mm -hmm. just the philosophy, let's love the language by the time we're done. Let's laugh tons. Like every yeah. class you're going to laugh no matter yeah. what, like there's going to be laughter. Every class you're going to see me mess up. Um, and just any way I can turn that re uh, pressure release dial as close to zero as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really important. So I don't know if that gets at your question, but that's some oh, it of does. How, oh, it definitely yeah. does. Yeah. 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 And that whole, like the, the pressure release valve of being able to make a mistake 
Yeah. I mean, you know, performative. I mean, this is just kind of shot through with higher ed, right? Uh, yes. There's a, a fear of uh, saying the wrong thing exactly. or looking dumb in front of your your peers, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there's all kinds of actually just like fears, um, things to hold you back shot through with, with the whole system. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, a question of um, are children better wired to acquire language than adults? Um, and actually, I mean, I, I think it's a bit, it depends what you mean, right. um, in terms of being able to, uh, so true. Ac acquire a language without an accent and to have, uh, native speaker intuitions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Children way, way better. But in terms of, how many instructional hours or whatever it takes to get you to some kind of um, conversational fluency or reading fluency, adults are way better. Mm -hmm. um, it, it takes way less time. And a lot of that is because, well, you've already constructed a system. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of transfer knowledge. Yeah. Um, but here's yeah. here's what I would say children maybe have the biggest advantage over adults is that children, especially young children, have little to no self-awareness. Yeah, That's no a inhibitions, huge, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No inhibitions, basically little to no self-awareness yeah. as far as, oh, that, like, that doesn't make sense. I don't know what you're saying. Or am I doing this right? Right? Like, I think, I mean, doing these things like learning to speak, learning to walk, um, I, I'm not sure that um, if 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 children had adult level self-awareness, if we would ever learn to walk, right? Because it's way too embarrassing how I'm, how I keep falling down, how I'm waddling. Um, and, um, and, and that goes to speaking too, right? Like, I mean, children yeah. say the, the darndest things. Um, and yeah. many times things that only their parents can understand. Um, we've got one who's, uh, he's turning two next month. And one of my favorite things that he says is, mine do it, mine do it, which means my do it, which is uh, I want to do it. Mm. Um, or, or actually, no, that's not quite my favorite. My favorite one is Dudin Dison, Dudin Dison, which is uh, doing this one, by which he means, what are you doing with that thing? Hmm. Um, like, I'm shaving. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, like, hey, but that's communication. Yeah, exactly. Because I know what he's asking. Yeah. Yeah. And then he can spiral upwards into, into fluency. Oh, right. Yeah. So anyway, like, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing that we have as a disadvantage with adults, I would put it simply is just self-awareness. Yeah. Self-awareness from there comes uh, a fear of messing up. Um, yeah. fear of, of looking stupid, et cetera. And so, and so then that's why I would say uh, what you're saying with like decrease the pressure valve um, of just like, Hey, it is, it's safe. It is expected um, to yeah. be able to, to make mistakes. Like you're only going to get um, a, approach fluency if you make, you know, maybe a certain number of mistakes. So just yeah. get going. Exactly. Um, and and if you give me if you give me um a hundred mistakes, I'll give you ten thousand. Um yeah, exactly. You know, there there is also a lot of so I, I have a have a, something of a colleague or a peer, I don't know how you'd say it, who just was relieved from a biblical languages position, a post because at university or seminary X that they were mm -hmm. working at, the 
department and perhaps trustees, whoever had influence, decided that the textbook they were going to use was going to be a certain popular textbook. Mm-hmm. Okay? This professor said, I don't want to use that. I'm not going to use that. I don't think it's good. And it stirred up this whole controversy. Um, and the argument sort of back was, well, um, somebody else in the department is working on edition two of this textbook. And mm-hmm. we have we have a good relationship with the publisher and they'll give us, the, us a discount. So give all our students a discount on that book if we use it all right so this this is absolutely infuriating to me all right so so what happens this this professor stands the ground and and uh comes to a head and he is let go okay and so there's also this side of things and it's not just like you are you are 100 percent correct like that academia already has like this structure, you know, uh, of grading. And I've, I've spent a lot of my time over the last 15 or so years at SBL conferences, regional and national, uh, criticizing and pushing back on that system, saying we need to rethink grading, we need to rethink quizzing and testing and these sort of things. I've been very critical about that um, to the chagrin of many people. So you have that side, but you also have this this other side, which is what I was talking about before, and it's where institutions are linked in with publishing houses, uh, yeah. and it comes down to a bottom line of money that, or there might be this better way to actually more effectively teach languages and do the language stuff over here, but because we're getting a discount and it saves money and we have we don't want to burn that bridge with the, the publishing house, we... You know, there's incentive there for discounts and whatever. We're going to keep doing it the way we've done it. Mm-hmm. And there's no way we're changing. And then an, uh, another part of that is that gives the authors and the publishing houses more incentive to continue creating revisions of textbooks and workbooks um, and, you know, a testing program. So you see this with other with publishing houses now, right? That you can you can sort of pay to do online uh you know testing and stuff it's it's ridiculous dude um and so you you have the stranglehold of the publishing realm on the one hand and then the stranglehold of like uh you know the the education system on the other hand and um it makes it really hard uh, for, it makes it hard yeah, it makes yeah. it really hard for Well, and then is is also when you have a big enough uh languages department where you kind of have to you have to play nice, right? Like right. if I'm teaching upper level, then I right. want I want my students to enter into my classroom knowing you know XYZ yeah. and so right. you need to prepare and so and I mean that that level of of working well together, um, you know, probably at minimum requires just like broadly speaking, using um, you know either grammar translation or communicative language right. uh, theory. That's yes. another dimension of it as well. Um, which, yeah, in order to to bring any kind of reform is is almost like this uh herculean um (laughs) overhaul right of like an entire department it's not just like one person many times um and so that also makes changing difficult yes absolutely and if you have tenure tied into that well forget it you know um yeah it's yeah so (laughs) it's it's a little disheartening and i can't tell you the number of people who stop by the gloss house booth every year at like national sbl um and tell us these kinds of stories yeah it's just oh i'd love to use your stuff but uh i can't yeah Uh, my department chair would never allow it trustees would never sign off on it 
uh, I just, it's, it's not going to happen, but I'm glad you guys are doing what you're doing. Mm. And it's like, Oh, it's so disheartening, man. Um, yeah. and you know, we'll, we'll keep fighting the good fight. I guess you can call it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've, we've, Glow's House, as far as like the publishing world, has been out on the the front, leading the way on this for twelve years now, and you know um, other people are doing good stuff too. But you know we we've consistently been at SPL and these sorts of things, uh, even ETS, and you know or have been in sessions advocating for this, and so yeah. hopefully you know it'll. And we're not like anti the grammar translation stuff either like we're producing that kind of stuff we're trying yeah. to create materials for the schools that can't get out of that framework you know we're, we're trying to produce materials that are better for them but man it's a whole is a whole system that you have to you know buck or whatever you want to say to to really just to get kids to, to get students to love the languages. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to me. Yeah. And I, I really love how you put it of like, well, man, basically could I just have one goal, which is make you fall in love with Greek or Hebrew or Latin. Um, and it does start with, do you love it? Yeah. And exactly. do you show that? Um, yeah. because yeah, I mean, um, um, uh, passion, uh, like an excitement about something, um, yeah. is, is contagious. I think um, a lot of students intuit as soon as they walk into their first day of Greek class or Hebrew class, that their teacher does not love it, that their teacher yeah. does not enjoy it. Um, and I think part of the reason a lot of our teachers don't love it and enjoy it is because they can't speak it. It's just a bunch of freaking rules in their heads, right? So I think students see that and pick up on that immediately. If they don't love it, why should I? Right. You know? Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, so I, I think that just has to ooze out, you know, constantly. And hopefully the students, you know, will will catch some of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, well, that, that was fun getting on that soapbox for a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, um, you know, going back to um, what I would like to do better. So, yeah, one of this is um, I think publishing these illustrated readers will be another level of making the language and these stories come alive um, and give that enjoyable yes. level of, I mean, hey, actually just like reading through this, this book um, yeah. and the well-illustrated pages and yeah. that I, I can understand this, um, this like it. I'm good at it, um, I think will help. So I'm excited to be able to, uh, Lord willing, publish these two volumes Absolutely. this summer. An another thing that I've been thinking about is just how can I push students to do more um, language production? Um, so I've had the, I've had my whole curriculum and what we do uh, revolve around learning the stories well. And so if they act out the full version of the story on Friday and they do their homework over the weekend, they take the quiz on Monday, part of Monday is I split them up and I have some uh, drawings for them of the story um, and I have them pair up across the room and then tell nice. the story you know, sometimes in their own words, but all in Hebrew, tell the story like from memory um, with with yeah. picture cues, et cetera. And just like just say it. Uh, it doesn't have to be right. So the listener don't correct whatever. Um, and so depending on how long the story is, maybe they have something like three minutes to tell the story from memory and the listeners stay the same and the storytellers mm. rotate. And then uh, the same storytellers uh, 
tell this story nice. three different times. So the first time you tell it to one person, you have three minutes to tell the story. Then you rotate. Now you tell it to a new person and you have two minutes and 15 seconds. So 45 fewer seconds. Tell the same story. Try to get through the same amount of material. Um, so fluency. Fluency, I think, is uh, repetition and being pushed to go a little right. bit faster than what you're comfortable with. And so this is a, a fluency building exercise. And then third time is 45 fewer seconds, a minute and a half, try to tell the whole story. And um, well, then on Wednesday, um, what we've been doing, and it's an exercise that I haven't been, well, some at the beginning, it's pretty easy to have the story and hey, it's a story about a, a man and a woman. Um, and uh, I'll have students go, I'll have the text being displayed on the board, and I'll have students um, in the moment change change the per perspective of the story. Oh, let's cool. not talk about them, but let's say this whole story is about me. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so then conjugate all the, you know, just read the story, spot read the story, spot um you know conjugate the verb and then some and then they'll also change the um attached pronoun um right. you know because it's not her hand but it's my hand it's not yada but yadi and so anyway like that i think is actually a yes, really absolutely. good exercise uh, and then we can also do it uh our um from from our perspective so we did it um and then um you know, instead of a, a snake, which has masculine agreement, you could change it to yeah. a cow and it will have feminine agreement. Um, and so that's really good. But then what's been so uh, I've been increasingly um, dissatisfied with a, a later thing where get into Vaiktol and basically I just I have students just read it and then convert the Vaiktol into a katal. And what I've been trying to think about is how do I get higher level language production out of students? And I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna pull this off, but I'm pretty committed. I'm very committed. The, for this next year, for the Wednesday session, um, to be students make up their own story with the words. You know, don't have to use all the words. And and probably what I'm going to have to do is, you know, so if the story uses 15 new vocab words or whatever, have the list of the 15 new vocab words, and then give a prompt. Right. Um, you know, something where it like immediately grabs your interest and then split students up and then have them create a story. What I'm thinking is I'm probably going to have to incorporate a homework into mm -hmm. it um, where maybe they can be kind of like building the story, um, at least parts of it, and then come together and then in class um, and uh, and maybe even draw uh, write it on the whiteboards and then i can come around and then also help Great. correct um and yeah yeah yeah. so that kind of gets back to another thing that you had said of uh you know do we have this like perfectionist Great. mentality Great. um and and um yes and no um so in terms of like producing materials you know on on our end like we need to be as um as just like committed as possible to not let any any errors any mistakes enter the text because like what's published is law uh, and students are like oh this is the way it is um but students know that in terms of like spontaneous production you know you can make mistakes and so um so on, in terms of like publishing, yeah, we want to be as perfect as possible. In terms of in the classroom, um, yeah, I mean, what you produce spontaneously, um, I don't know. Uh, students make mistakes in class, and I don't know, I'll probably correct fewer than 25% of the mistakes made in class. Um, and maybe I should correct fewer than what that. Is, I'm not quite the, sure. What is the um, percentage... Like if you had to, if you could put a number on it, like are you 
are you speaking a hundred percent Hebrew in your class sessions, or is it ninety percent? Uh, what what is that's the, a good question. What mm-hmm. percentage would you stick on that? My goal is ninety percent, and I would say first semester I definitely hit that. Um, second semester with some other things that we have going on, um, I. I bet if there was like, you know, you transcribed Hebrew class and whatever, I'm I'm not so sure we hit 90%, certainly above 75%. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's interesting stuff. I mean, we could probably talk pedagogy all day and, you know, classroom, classroom right. exercises. I even, you know, I, it's interesting to hear a comment about publishing too. And I certainly am there, like we should minimize errors and that sort of thing. I'm all, I've also always yeah. taken comfort in the idea that, like, you know, it used to be a really popular thing. It doesn't happen as much anymore, but, you know, like, authors would, like, six months out or a year out or whatever, like, after reviews started rolling in for books, would would often publish, like, errata lists or, you know, like, a, they yeah. become, like, addenda to the books. And, um, you know, I, I've often taken comfort in the fact, okay, this is, you know, and and I don't know about you, man, but like, I I have this weird thing where I can I can write or produce a book and read it through a thousand times, and then like the yes. minute it goes into print, I find an error, a typo in, it. you know, like which is, even you know I've had other eyes on it too and that sort of thing, but like there's this weird just phenomenon that happens of that. So I I've always been of the mindset like since I've been an author and a, a content resource creator that even if it does end up having an error, it's better to have it out there than not at this stage. Cause there's a, there's a, a mm-hmm. paucity of resources. Um, so I don't know. You may disagree with me on that and that's okay. But I, I, yeah, that that's kind of been like my thing and that's, that's been sort of the, part of the engine that's kept me going like okay i've done the best i can do i've had other eyes on this let's get it out let the public review it if they find things hopefully they'll submit them and we'll you know we'll fix it but yeah i don't know yeah right yeah yeah i mean how yeah i mean it, it 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 starts with a mindset of like i hate yeah, errors sure. any errors i don't want there to be any errors and then yeah but at the end of the day like we're we're all all human and so you can you you stick to it like a matter of principle i yeah. don't want there to be any errors and i've done what yeah. i can and yeah you're right like to some degree just looking it over one more time um does not does not mean that you're going to catch that error um, and, and so sometimes you just yeah. got to get it out there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's different tricks, right. As far as, um, uh, doing yeah, copy yeah, editing, yeah. um, sometimes it's helpful to, to look through just for a certain yeah. kind of thing. Um, you know, if, and I don't know, there's, there's certainly different tricks, but yeah, at the end of the day, like you're human and you're not going to be able to catch everything. And yeah, I mean, errors, you're right. That's a good point of errors in published materials um, is certainly not limited to language resource materials. Yeah, exactly. Like, Yeah. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I have often wondered, you know, I, I have such a strong sort of reaction, allergic reaction to you you come into the classroom, you can't make errors. You know, well, my philosophy is the opposite yes. of that. But I, I have often wondered if some of our – because, right, I know people I – know, I know a guy who's been a professor for 45, maybe 50 years now and hasn't published nearly anything. I actually know two professors that come immediately to mind um, who are like that. And why? They're, they say they're perfectionists, but two, I think the real reason is that they're scared. There's a fear of how other mm. academics in their circles are going to criticize them if they find, um, you know, 
errors, not just typos, but like, you know, a miscitation or, you know, a, a bad argument. And so like that whole fear right. that comes with making a mistake in the classroom, like it also exists at a higher level with publishing that I kind of just, I wish didn't exist. I, again, I wish I could release some of the pressure yeah. valve on that. Not saying like we're trying right, to make right. errors or that we're not being careful um, because I agree with you. We should try to limit that and not, not have it. But I wish I could just turn down the pressure dial on that too. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, I'm a, up on a, you know, uh, high horse here, but. Yeah. Now, Marissa had, Marissa, my wife thinks that I'm a bit of a, perfectionist and i almost always resist that because i've seen perfectionism in some people mm -hmm. keep them from yes, producing things absolutely. or it's been um it's a it's a kind of a yes. crippling perfectionism absolutely. and um yeah i mean every, everybody's yeah. got their temperament right um and but i i don't think to to the degree that you know I don't want to produce whatever with with errors and it goes um you know um to producing a sermon or producing right. you know producing yes. whatever um i mean if it's going to if it's going to cripple you from producing something that would be yeah. helpful to others then then yeah, that's a shame. It's like that's the, shame. the three tra transcendentals, right? Good, tr goodness, truth, and beauty. Like when we when we publish, we want it to be as good, true, and beautiful as possible. And when we preach that sermon, we want it to be yeah. as good and true and beautiful as possible. Um, and so I think that's a good litmus test. But yeah, I, I'm getting at exactly what you're putting your finger on there. Is that fear, that sort of culture of fear that surrounds surrounds these things um and that that's my issue obviously my issue isn't a work that is free of errors or you know whatever but right. it's, it's the the other part that that fear that cripples people or prevents people or you know whatever and man i've known too many people like that and i i've always just decided in my mind i i'd rather put myself out there and be open to exposing errors that I've made than not. And so kind of, you know, yeah. advocate for that. But uh, yeah, I, I think, I think that's good. What the, the disclaimer you've added there, I think is a really good one. Um, so you, you <laughs> you're finishing up uh, these two volumes of stories and um, yeah, you got some good stuff coming and, Man, we're glad. I'm glad to know you. I'm glad to be working with you and helping promote yourself. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, speaking of errors, I mean, you've released like multiple volumes of like the picture Hebrew stuff, you know, and it's getting better. You know, it's gotten better each time. So uh, that mm -hmm. that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't just started. You know, like let's put this out there. Right. Like, right. You know, went through yeah. several instantiations and. Um, you know, you, you just had to do it. You had to go for it. And, yeah. Um, so looking forward to the new resources that you guys are working on, you and Marissa. And, uh, you guys are doing great work. Keep up the great work there at, at Sattler as well. And, you know, blessings to you folks. Um, yeah. So can, where can people find you? I often ask this. You're on social media. You have your own website. Where, where, where do people find you? Ah. Well, as far as the the published materials, uh, Hebrew wise, I think it's pretty much all right on Glossa House, um, and I have basically zero <laughs> social media um, presence. Good for you. Um. <laughs> yeah i I got off. Uh, you know, I, I got off summer of 2020 because I needed to finish my dissertation and COVID was a lot of things for a lot of different people. For me, it was kind of an opportunity and an opportunity to just hunker down and, and knock out my dissertation. So I had my wife sign me out, lock me out of all my social media accounts. Um, well, that also ended up being 
right? Yeah. I mean, COVID, George yeah. Floyd, the the um, Where the election. I mean, it was yeah. a tremendously was tumultuous right? time. Anything you said was yeah. It was it was it was an explosive tumultuous summer and i was i was off and my mental health was really good <laughs> and i've had i've had basically no desire to get back on well, can't blame you for that well check out uh, glowsouth.com and you can see jesse and marissa's work there great stuff um and we've done other stuff with him on the podcast you can find that as well um so yeah check out the proof text podcast and glosa house tv which is at the time of recording this, I mean, it's really starting to pick up and, and you know, gain some mm. steam. So we're really thrilled about that. But, Jesse, man, it's good seeing you as always. And, um, yeah, That's friends, so thank you for listening or watching. We're going to stop there and say we hope that helps. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.